Thank you, Professor Razali. Now I would request our former Indian ambassador, Ambassador V.P. Haran, to speak about South Asian politics. Professor Sridham Charlia, Ambassador Castellanos, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassadors Baskar Balakrishnan and Mohan Kumar, Mr. Abdul Haq Azad from the Afghan Embassy, uh, Dr. Pankaj Jha, and other distinguished guests, uh, students and guests of the OP Jindal Global University. A uh, very good morning to all of you. Now, uh, I want to reassure uh, the Dean of the Dipl Diplomatic Corps on something which is said about not pe I mean people, not people from in India not recognizing his country. Let me share with you one simple uh, anecdote, uh, just as you started with an anecdote. And I was ambassador in Bhutan, and our prime minister had visited. And a few days later, uh, you know, a, a meeting of a group of ambassadors was uh, called in Delhi, and I had come for that. And I went to a reputed hotel, as reputed as the hotel to which, in which I checked in when he came here. And I told them that I come from Timpu. I mean, the lady, I mean, the receptionist, I told her that I come from Timpu because there was a booking there. Timpu, uh, is it in Mizoram? And, you know, and then I said, no, it's not in Mizoram. It's, uh, you know, it's the capital of Bhutan. And uh, again, she didn't have a clue as to wh where is Bhutan, despite our prime minister having visited just uh, 10 minutes before, I mean, 10 uh, days before that to Bhutan. And she thought it's, it's a state in the Northeast. Uh, and I had to, uh, you know, before she asked me whether I'm a Tessindar or district collector, I relieved her of her agony and told her Bhutan is an independent country and I've come from there, I have a booking, please go ahead and allot me the room. So it's, I don't think you should take uh, offense if they don't know about Bhutan, I'm not surprised that they didn't know about Dominican Republic. Uh, the purpose, I mean, the, my, uh, you know, ap uh, approach would be, of course, uh, in a little more, uh, you know, to the uh, core of the subject, to give you a flavor of regional diplomacy and also to give you a flavor of what uh, problems that, uh, I mean, uh, are being dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis by Indian diplomats and Indian Foreign Office. So I hope I succeed in that. Uh, one of the, you know, over the last 60 years, uh, you know, uh, regional trading arrangements uh, have proved to be effective catalysts for accelerating economic integration and growth of some regions with its attendant benefits like increased employment opportunities for people of the region, reduction in poverty levels, improvement in the welfare of people, etc. Such cooperation leads to creation of regional value chains and usually expands the markets available for the country's products. Involvement in these arrangements also help in making the products competitive. Uh, at the inaugural session of the Kathmandu Summit in 2014, that is November 2014, PM Modi said, and I quote, because in the life of an individual or a nation, a good neighborhood is a universal aspiration. Where does South Asia wish to stand in this world? Nowhere in the world are collective efforts more urgent than in South Asia. And nowhere else is it so modest. Big and small, we face the same challenges a long climb to the summit of development. Yet, when we speak of SAR, we usually hear two reactions, cynicism and skepticism. This, sadly, is in a region throbbing with the optimism of our youth. These words bring out the need for regional cooperation, particularly in South Asia, and also highlights the current state of cooperation in this region. Regional cooperation uh, can also bring about peace, uh, st peace and stability which are essential for focusing on development-related issues. Now, from uh, now, let's go into the specific, uh, uh, you know, uh, regional cooperation effort in South Asia, which is SARC. Uh, South Asia was one of the most integrated regions anywhere in the world before 1947. This would surprise some of you. Uh, the political boundaries drawn in 1947 divided the people and made most linkages inoperative, and. Uh, made South Asia one of the least integrated regions of the world, least connected regions of the world. In many cases, we are now endeavoring to re-establish this old uh, earlier linkages. Such efforts were at bilateral levels till 1985 when SARC was formed at a meeting in Dhaka. 
the objective of SARC, as stated in the preamble to the SARC Charter, is to promote peace, stability, amity, and progress in the region. SARC was tasked to promote welfare of the people of the region, improve the quality of their life, and promote and strengthen collective self-reliance among members, all eminently laudable objectives. Members are battling similar problems of widespread poverty, unemployment, inequality, underdevelopment, social and political ten tensions, etc. SARC is a grouping of countries that are large and small. They have different political systems and different approaches to economic development. It, has the, it was the hope of leaders that through cooperation at regional level, they would be able to promote peace and stability in the region by focusing on mutual understanding, accelerated development, and by addressing the problems of malnutrition and poverty. Keeping in view the uh, serious uh, political issues dividing them, members uh, decided that all decisions in SARC will be by unanimity and bilateral and contentious issues would be cal excluded from the SARC fora. South Asian states are linked through history, geography, and a shared cultural heritage. But unfortunately, today they are divided by politics, which is seriously inhibit inhibiting realization of the objectives that member states set for themselves. A bolder step, uh, an important step was taken in 2006 with the uh, establishment of SAFTA, South Asian Free Trade Agreement. It is a carefully crafted agreement that factored in the differing levels of development of member states. The agreement has, however, not resulted in any dramatic increase in intra-SARC trade, with trade among SARC countries being just $27 billion, uh, that is around 6% of the global trade of the SARC countries. An UN SCAP study of 2017 captioned unlocking the potential of regional economic cooperation and integration in South Asia, uh, estimated the potential for intra-regional trade in SARC in 2014 at $81 billion. They further said it has the potential to be doubled to, to be more than doubled to $171 billion by 2020. Even if the SCAP assessment if of potential for trade among SAR countries is somewhat optimistic, I'm sure all of you will agree that there is immense potential for significantly increasing intra-SAR trade. Reasons uh, for uh, the poor levels of uh, intra-SAR trade are many. First and foremost, foremost is many of the members, in fact, I would say none of the members, were keen to open up the markets to even regional competition. If you see the negative list they had drawn up and attached to SAFTA trade, it covers almost all the, all the goods that they produce, which means I mean, they're not interest, interested in competition from even regional countries. Uh, secondly, uh, SARC economies being from the same agroeconomic and climatic zone or parallel economies growing or producing and exporting similar products. To that extent, scope for trade among the SARC members is somewhat constrained. Further, poor infrastructure at the border, uh, TBT measures, and high cost of intra-regional trade are not conducive to promoting trade. Politics also has weighed heavily in Pakistan's decision to deny MFN, statement, uh, MFN treatment to India as is required under WTO rules. At the 18th SARC summit, the, uh, this, that's the Kathmandu summit, leaders decided inter alia uh, rather renewed their commitment uh, to achieve South Asian Economic Union in a phased and planned manner through a FTA, a customs union, a common market, and a common economic and monetary union. They also renewed commitment to substantially enhance uh, regional connectivity in a seamless manner. Progress, if any, on the above decisions has been minimal and very slow prompting many informed observers to question the effectiveness of SAR as a forum to address the common problems of the member states. The 19th SAR summit was to be held in Islamabad in 2016, but is yet to be held uh, due to uh, Pakistan's continuing support and direct involvement in cross-border terrorist activities. Uh, this is, uh, meetings do take place at lower levels, but uh, you know, a summit level meeting has its own advantages because it can give momentum and direction to the activities of SARC. 
this is not to suggest that SARC has been a complete disaster. There have been uh, quite a few success stories. Some of them are, of course, uh, some of these institutions have not measured up to the full potential, but will, hope, will hopefully do so in the coming uh, years. One is the SATIS or South Asian Agreement in Services. Second is the SARC Framework Convention on Energy Cooperation. Uh, third is the SARC Motor Vehicles Agreement and Railways Agreement. This was finalized but could not be signed at Kathmandu uh, because of objection of the last minute from uh, Pakistan. We also have some successful institutions like uh, SARC Development Fund, SARC uh, uh, South Asia University, SARC Regional Standards Organization, and SARC Arbitration Council. These are all functioning institutions. Given its size, population, market, GDP, and location at the center of SARC, India has a critical role in the success of SARC and regional development. Conscious of this, uh, we have taken uh, several uh, initiatives beyond the agreed joint programs of SARC. Its focus uh, has been, I mean, the focus of these efforts have been trade, connectivity, trade facilitation, and people-to-people -people contacts. However, India has to keep the sensitivities of the smaller neighbors in view and treat the path cautiously. At the Kathmandu summit, a PM noted that less than 6% of region's uh, global trade takes place between SARC members. Of this, less than 10% only is under the uh, under SAPTA. Less than 1% of investment by Indian companies is in the SARC region. He observed, and I quote, as SARC, we have failed to move with the speed that our people expect and want. Some argue that it is because of the region's development gap, but that would actually, that should actually spur us to do more, unquote. He asked if members are stuck behind the walls of differences and hesitant to move out of the shadows of the past. This, he said, won't resolve the differences, but would only deprive us of the opportunities. While clearly identifying what ails are, PM indicated India's readiness to address many of the problems but this requires the cooperation of other members. It is often said that India being the largest country uh, in the region should go the extra mile and offer unilateral concessions uh, to uh, neighbors. What this fails to recognize is that we are already doing so on many fronts for many decades. Trade and economic arrangements we have with Nepal and Bhutan right from Independence Days are the most liberal anywhere in the world. The uh, FTA we have with uh, Sri Lanka signed in December 2000, sorry, 1998, provided for a much longer phase-in period for Sri Lanka. Uh, we have given duty-free access to 99.7% of the products of the six uh, of the uh, LDC, five LDCs in the SARC region. Large number of people from the neighboring countries seek, come here seeking jobs in India, and uh, we have not taken any action against those who have come here through uh, irregular means. We also provide essential sub, uh, essentials to countries like Bhutan and Maldives, even when there is a blanket ban on export of these items because of shortages in India. We have extended MF and status to Pakistan, but Pakistan is yet to reciprocate. The question arises, why has uh, um, cooperation under SARC framework not taken off in South, uh, in South Asia? An important reason for lack of progress in SARC is the political tension between India and Pakistan, because of which Pakistan is standing in the way of greater economic cooperation, even in such areas of cooperation where Pakistan itself would benefit. The unanimity rule for decision making, while intended to reassure India's smaller neighbors, also comes in the way of faster decision making. Pakistan has made full use of this. Greater economic integration and intra-regional trade would be facilitated if there is cross-border investment and value chains. This would require the FTA to cover services apart from goods. Our neighbors have much to gain uh, from India's growth and many in those countries acknowledge this. There is, however, continuing reluctance on the part of our partners to move in this direction due to trust deficit due in some measure to India's size which uh, Professor Charlie also pointed out, and dominance of the region. Poor border infrastructure, trade facilitation, and high cost of intra-regional trade have also acted as dampeners. Neighbors have a tendency to play the China card 
which they see as an insurance against domination of the region by India. SARC needs to step up efforts on trade and investment flows, trade facilitation, border infrastructure, transportation, which will deliver uh, meaningful economic results to the people, and thus win their support over. Meaningful cooperation in less contentious areas such as disaster management, environmental issues, pollution, etc., would also helping, uh, help in winning our people's support. The quest for an economically integrated South Asia has remained largely elusive, and the momentum is flagging. Uh, views on progress of regional cooperation efforts in South Asia vary uh, from broad optimism, which is based on some important decisions, to cynicism and pessimism, as pointed out by our Prime Minister, uh, uh, arising from the slow and tardy progress in take, taking and implementing decisions. We need to be realistic in our ambitions, keeping in view the political environment. Despite the evident advantages in regional economic cooperation and the urgent need for it, politics and emotions have stood as barriers in South Asia. Uh, should India take the lead in SARC uh, organizations? I would submit that beyond a point, it would be counterproductive for India to take the lead because of the lack of trust and, uh, and suspicion among our members about India's intentions. Some find India's size intimidating. Trust needs to be built up patiently and over a period of time. In the meantime, India should do whatever is possible from its side. I'm not suggesting, uh, suggesting abandoning of our responsibility and leaving the pace of progress to be determined by uh, Pakistan's whims, other available options could be explored. Now I'll move on to the next section of my presentation, which is on the uh, on regional diplomacy and the problems we are faced with on a daily basis. I mentioned about the problems created by 1947, and unfortunately, uh, I must acknowledge that we have added to the discomfort of us of our smaller neighbors by our words and actions, uh, which was done often unwittingly. Reactions of neighbors are often disproportionate, and we are generally the favorite whipping boy in the neighborhood. Neighborhood diplomacy, in my view, is the most challenging. Uh, first, the issues, uh, issue of border demarcation, uh, just to uh, give a brief update on that. Uh, we are now uh, in a major border problem with either Bhutan or Nepal. The borders are mostly settled, excepting for the tri-junction. Of course, in the case of Nepal, there are two small stretches where demarcation is said to be completed. Pakistan, you know the uh, problem there. Uh, Sri Lanka, the maritime boundary was settled in 1974. With Bangladesh, we settled both the ba maritime boundary and uh, land boundary only recently, 2014 and 15. With Myanmar, we have no serious uh, problems of, of boundary demarcation. Uh, neighbors are highly sensitive. This is something which we cannot afford to forget. Uh, and they read meanings into our statements even when none is intended. This makes it imperative for us to be careful in what we say. Uh, on certain issues, we need to make a distinction between the state and the people of uh, and the people, and should refrain from action that could hurt the people. Uh, then we have the border-related issues. I'm referring to problems of human trafficking, smuggling, movement of fake Indian currency, etc. Apart from that, there is the issue of illegal immigration, about which I think all of you must be reading in the newspapers these days. An important way of strengthening relations with neighbors is to create interdependent relations. Talk of economic integration makes our neighbors suspicious. The more acceptable political terminology for them is economic interdependence. We should be focusing on projects that promote interlinkages like hydropower projects and connectivity projects. Need to encourage cross-border investments in the neighborhood. There is need to encourage cross-border investments in the neighborhood by Indian companies. Free trade agreements also promote interdependence by encouraging manufacturing value chains across the region. People of this region have a lot in common, uh, culture, language, religion, etc. India has a natural advantage, advantage in this region. We need to develop strategies to make use of this advantage. We have lost ground to China in the last decade or so in this region. Uh, Chinese investments in the neighboring countries are aimed at either uh, gaining strategic advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis India or in ga gaining a strategic foothold in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, they've, they've invested in almost all the countries in the neighborhood excepting Bhutan. 
Our pockets are not deep enough to compete with the Chinese, but we should focus on areas of critical interest to us and also work through our neighbors to keep the Chinese out of strategically important areas and projects. We have succeeded in doing it uh, on quite a few fronts. There is now a growing awareness of the objectives and effects of Chinese investments, which could be made use of by us quietly. Some positive developments have taken place in the recent past. In uh, Sri Lanka and in Maldives, uh, China had become an election issue. Uh, as you know, generally foreign policy is never debated during uh, elections, but this was an exception. And this led to pro-China incumbents losing in the elections. Now I'll move on to uh, uh, country-specific issues that we are dealing with. Of course, we have a, a distinguished representative from the Afghan embassy who will deal with uh, Afghanistan. But uh, let me uh, tell you in very brief, uh, security situation in Afghanistan which is, is deteriorating, which is of concern to us, uh, you know, for the simple reason that we are hearing about uh, ISIS establishing a base in Afghanistan. I don't know how far, how far it is true. There is also a resurgence of Taliban, which cannot be denied. Uh, the uh, number of countries dealing directly with Taliban have increased, of course, apart from Russia and Iran recently, the U.S. also has established uh, contact with Taliban. Uh, in the light of this and also in the light of the recognition of Taliban as a political force even by the Afghan president, I think we need to reassess our policy on Taliban. On to Bangladesh. We have been having a dream run in our, in our relations uh, with Bangladesh in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, land and mar maritime boundaries have been settled. We have been able to gain access through, Pakistan, uh, through Bangladesh. There is transit through ba uh, Bangladesh to our northeast. We have rail link, we have road link, we have inland waterways uh, link also. Uh, of course, this issue of migration is there, but uh, you would have noted that uh, the reaction of Bangladesh on this issue, I mean, on, uh, on what's happening in Assam, is rather muted. Then there is a question of sharing of river waters. On this, uh, uh, you know, of course, we are at fault. We signed an agreement to share the river waters, but we have not been able to implement it because West Bengal government is objecting. Uh, an important development with uh, Bangladesh is power tree. We are supplying something like eight, 700 plus uh, megawatts of power to Bangladesh, which is likely to go beyond 10, beyond 1,000 uh, with the inauguration of a new interconnection facility for an additional 500 megawatts quite recently. And what is important to note here is, this has been welcomed by the industries in uh, Bangladesh. Even uh, industrialists who are supportive of BNP welcome this and uh, would not object to this continued uh, trade because they stand to benefit uh, uh, from this because they don't have to generate diesel power which is more expensive and polluting. On to Bhutan, we have a new government there. Third elections are completed successfully. We have no major problems with Bhutan. There's only, uh, there are two issues there. One is the hydropower project. Some of them have got delayed. There is cost escalation. There is also a concern in Bhutan about hydro, uh, hydropower debt, which is mounting. I mean, which is true because 78% of their external debt is uh, hydropower debt. Uh, we need to sit across the table with the new government and explain to them that hydropower debt is not harmful to the economy because the payment starts only after the projects start uh, paying dividends. Uh, so, and, uh, and that uh, it's a self-liquidating debt. On to, uh, and the other problem is the new generation coming up in Bhutan because uh, their goodwill towards India is not, will not be at the same level as that of the elder generation. Because the elder generation had seen the benefits of cooperating with India, has seen what India has done for them in the last 50 years, which is not the case with the younger generation. On to Nepal, the major concern is the growing influence of China in Nepal and also Chinese activities in Nepal. There is also the problem of perception about India and Nepal, about which we need to do something. Uh, there is uh, a welcome development in our relations with uh, Nepal on the water and hydropower front. There is uh, more willingness on the part of Nepal to cooperate with us on this because it's mutually beneficial. We have been exporting power to Nepal, uh, roughly about 380 megawatts or so, and uh, that is completely lit up with Kathmandu Valley 24-7. And before that, I used to hear from my ambassador that, uh, from our ambassador, that there used to be uh, sometimes 14 uh, hours power cut in Kathmandu village. This is just about two, three years back. Pakistan, I think all of you know what the problem is, Kashmir terrorism, and of course, uh, denial of American status. But what is more important is uh, their, fail, uh, their unwillingness to give transit 
for Afghan exports to India. Uh, on to uh, Maldives, of course, uh, you know, new elections have, uh, you know, unseated the uh, outgoing president. And uh, the new president, uh, Ibn Soli, uh, I, I think will be a lot more objective in uh, you know, assessing uh, Maldives' interest. Uh, some of the projects that China is executing there are of concern to us, and uh, I'm sure we'll be sharing this concern with the incoming president. The projects which uh, the Chinese are executing uh, here and in Sri Lanka, that is namely the Hambantota port and Matale airport, now these are basically aimed at gaining a strategic advantage in that uh, in a foothold in uh, the Indian Ocean region. And it's also not too far from the shipping, uh, the, uh, one of the most important shipping lanes in the world. Sri Lanka, we are concerned about the recent uh, developments on the domestic situation. Uh, well, not directly concerned, but uh, you know, we had to be concerned when India, uh, they started blaming India for, uh, or accusing India, I should say, of plotting to overthrow uh, some of the top officials there, the top leaders there. Of course, the Sri Lankan leadership did not believe it, and they immediately spoke to us. And um, uh, you know, uh, hopefully things are behind uh, the thing. But you know, as I told you, India is a favorite whipping boy. In, in, in case anything goes wrong domestically, the, the first person they blame is India. Then we have this, uh, I mean, we are also interested in the situation in Northeast, that is Sri Lanka. Uh, early stabilization will help us too, because otherwise we are uh, constantly faced with the problem of uh, Sri Lankan Tamils coming into uh, Tamil Nadu. Myanmar, we have excellent security cooperation, but it has not delivered the desired uh, level of uh, results. Uh, I mean, partly, uh, you know, there is uh, some capacity constraint on the part of Myanmar. Uh, it's also a fact that Myanmar is used, is used as a transit point for movement of weapons and uh, and uh, men, uh, that is Indian insurgents, from Myanmar's border with uh, China, from where they go across to China, receive training and come back. Uh, but they are cooperating to the extent possible. We're also interested in the peace process in Myanmar, not because we are directly involved in it, but any peace, uh, you know, uh, peace agreement, settlement reached with the in, uh, insurgent groups in Myanmar will also be helpful to us because these very same groups are operating within uh, India also in the Northeast. Final, and uh, Kaladan multimodal project has been delayed by decades. Uh, it's time that we get our act together and ensure that it is uh, implemented, I mean, completed as quickly as possible because that will give uh, access for, our, for the products of our Northeast to Southeast Asia. Finally, China. I think uh, most of you know about the problems with China, so we're not going to detail. You know, China is both a principal adversary and I would say a strategic challenge. It offers many opportunities as well. Uh, we had the border issue about which I referred earlier. We also had this border, a problem of uh, trans-border rivers uh, where uh, some unilateral action being taken by China is uh, causing concern to us in Bangladesh. But we should note that the border is generally peaceful. Considering that border is not demarcated and uh, you know, there are uh, uh, several uh, segments where the border is not clear, uh, the uh, skirmishes that happen in the, uh, at the border are very, very minimal. What is happening is China is aiming for preeminence in Asia and also the world in due course. This clashes with India's objective of a multipolar world where India will have its due place. China's assertive behavior has, of course, uh, created problems for itself. Uh, the, it has, of course, made some moderating overtures to Japan and South Korea, and is also reaching out to India. But I view it as a tactical move by China, uh, not something that they have thought through carefully. They're doing it only because there is a tremendous pressure from the Trump administration. We need to work with others to reduce the impact of China, uh, adverse impact of China on us. Uh, and the last point with China is, uh, uh, the strong economic and military link that they have with uh, Pakistan. I'll conclude here. I hope I've been able to give a flavor of what is, you know, what we deal with in foreign office on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll be happy to take on uh, any questions in the, uh, later in the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador VP Haran. Unfortunately, due to some prior commitments, uh, Ambassador Frank Hans would be leaving us early. So I would request Professor Mohan Kumar to facilitate our ambassador with JG Memento. Okay, please. 
So uh, now I request former Indian ambassador ba uh, Bhaskar Balakrishnan to speak. Okay, a long series of speeches. Dr. Chaulia D, School of International Affairs, JGU, Ambassador Mohan Kumar, my good friend and colleague, <coughs> Embajador Castellanos de la Republica Dominicana, my distinguished dignitaries, colleagues, and my young friends. Thank you, and especially Diplomania, for the invitation to be here today and the opportunity to be at this university and this conference. I'm sure it will be a great success and you will all take back something valuable from this experience. That is the strength of youth. I will speak to you on regional cooperation in South Asia, which I believe is a dream worth pursuing, despite the gloomy scenarios that often are talked about. Now, in the international system populated by nation states, the interactions between states can be described by three big C's, cooperation, competition, and conflict. There are some more C's which come into the picture, like confusion, which I am trying to understand, and communication, but communication, we assume, exists in some form or the other. The three big C's are present in a varying mix in any bilateral relationship. They become more intense when states are neighbors and they are closely coupled through numerous linkages. Geography, after all, cannot be changed. Rational state leaders must therefore strive to maximize cooperation, engage in constructive competition, and minimize and manage conflicts. This is the case with all regions, including South Asia. Across Europe, Latin America, Africa, and the Far East, Despite tensions and conflicts, the broad trend is towards stronger regional cooperation. Europe started this after the end of World War II, and today the EU will probably overcome the new challenge posed by the impending exit of a large member state. ASEAN and the African Union have also built fairly robust frameworks for cooperation. In stark contrast, our region which is home to three large and powerful economies, that is China, Japan, and India, and home to hardworking and talented people, and with a proud civilizational history, has not moved forward. We are still prisoners of conflicts which veto progress in cooperation and healthy competition. What can we do if a country wants to hold cooperation hostage to a conflicting interest? Well then, we have to move on with the other countries and hope that in the future, enlightenment will prevail. It is also a great challenge to maintain cooperation in the face of deliberate and destructive use of terrorism by the official agencies of any state. Such a state cannot be taken seriously. It will pay the price for creating and sustaining a monster. But there are some rays of hope. In the modern era, the rise of democracy and articulation of people's desires has made the old nation state less powerful. Modern technology has vastly increased the voice of the people and the leaders have to pay heed. Autocratic regimes can buy legitimacy by offering growth or promising good governance, but only for a limited time. Remember what Gandhi told the British, and the British said, we'll give you good governance. He said, but we want our governance. So the governance of the people is what everybody wants. There is glowing clamor, clamor among the people of our region for stronger and more meaningful regional cooperation across national boundaries. In the internet age, people can now communicate across national boundaries with ease. I will focus for, on the potential for building regional cooperation in some areas. My colleagues have mentioned quite a few other areas such as trade and gone into each country. The scope is vast and the promise of win-win outcomes is there to be realized. Firstly, health. 
We must cooperate in monitoring and controlling outbreaks of diseases, old and new. Together we can do this much more effectively at a lower cost than separately. We can also extend advanced medical treatment across borders by direct movement of patients as well as through telemedicine linkages between hospitals. In primary and universal health care, we can benefit from the experience of countries such as Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Thailand, which have achieved good results. Nobody should be too proud to learn. Next, environment. We can and should cooperate in monitoring and reducing air pollution, which goes across national boundaries and directly affects the health of our people. Pollutant particles of micron size can travel in the air for hundreds of kilometers, delivering their deadly cargo into the lungs of our children and our parents. The next few months in Delhi will drive home this point to all of us. Why is there no regional project to fight this menace? Water quality in rivers and ground sources has deteriorated. We can work together to find durable solutions to this problem so that our people can at least drink and cook with safe water. Next, disaster management. Cooperation is essential. Even large countries cannot go it alone. Joint disaster management framework will cut costs, speed response, and reduce the requirement of stocks of emergency equipment, supplies, and personnel for fighting disasters. In the last months, during the unprecedented floods in Kerala, I think a lot of you are from Kerala, my home state, help poured in from all over the country. We must do this on a regional scale. Disasters are certain to increase in frequency and intensity due to global warming, and we must be well prepared. Next, energy. Here, cooperation through electrical grids and gas pipelines can be of great help. Temporary shortages and deficits in one area can be met by borrowing energy from a surplus area. The whole system becomes more economical and effective when scaled up to a regional level. We know this from our own experience within a large country. Gas and oil pipelines such as TAPI and IPI have been discussed, but many obstacles remain. The European example of the Energy Charter Treaty and its later non-binding versions should be emulated. These instruments provide a sound legal framework for resolving differences between and protecting the interests of energy producing, consuming and transit countries, as well as private investors. They also ensure security and stability of energy supply and fulfillment of contracts. Based on this experience, a South Asian energy charter can be worked out. But unfortunately, with a few exceptions, our policymakers do not seem to be aware of these important energy-related developments in Europe. The next, transport. We need almost seamless transport by road and rail across our region. The resulting greater movement of people, goods, across national boundaries will have a strong positive impact on trade and tourism and create jobs and growth in the border regions. The border crossing points need to have more capacity and be better organized to handle increasing traffic. Transit countries can earn substantial revenue from transit fees and landlocked states can get access to the sea. Switzerland, in the heart of Europe, earns a lot of money because of transit from north to south and east to west across Europe. Next, ICT. We can improve connectivity across our region through terrestrial and satellite networks and open the doors to cross-border use for activities such as tele-education, entertainment, scientific research, etc. Using ICT, we can improve our educational experience at all levels, improve governance and service delivery, and release the creative energy of our youth. The impact of social media is already great, and we can foresee it building linkages between people across our region. We have so much to share by way of culture, from food, clothing, 
art forms such as cinema, theater, and music. ICT and social media will, in the future, reinforce the trend towards a shared South Asian identity. Next, research and education. Our research capability will be amplified through collaboration between our research institutions and universities. Mobility of researchers, faculty, and students is a powerful stimulant. Look at Europe as it advances towards the goal of a single European educational area, that's the Bologna process, and a single European research area, that's the Ljubljana process. We are not even near this, even in, within our country, let alone in the region. So there is a vast scope to move ahead. Next, marine ecosystems. The Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal are two of the large marine ecosystems out of the 66 identified under the Global Environmental Facility, the GEF. These two systems are at very high risk of depletion of marine living resources, and th this threatens the livelihood and food of millions of our coastal population. There is no integrated management of these two ecosystems by the concerned coastal states. Unlike other ecosystems, such as the Gulf of Guinea, the Yellow Sea, etc. In our case, we have not even begun to discuss about how to manage our two large marine ecosystems. Pressure is building up as negotiations for a high seas treaty move ahead, pushed by global concern over the deteriorating marine environment. Soon it might be too late if the coastal states in our region do not shoulder their responsibility. Next. Uh, hot subject, democracy building and strengthening. No democracy is perfect. All have flaws which need fixing. But the democratic deficit is much less than in the case of an authoritarian regime. Those of us who live in a democratic state must not take it for granted. Eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. We must continue the struggle to make our elections clean and fair our political parties managed with transparency and accountability and a constructive debate over real issues, better participation of women and strengthened participation in general of the population in all the processes of democracy. We can share experiences and best practices across our countries in all these fields. There is also the ph phenomenon of capture of the state by powerful interest groups within a state, be it from the military, be it from the corporate sector, or from religious organizations. This is an interesting phenomenon which is unfolding before us uh, as, as we live now. Next, media independence. Journalists in some of our countries face threats, both professional and personal. A strong and independent media is essential for a democracy system and this is the reason why enemies of democracy seek to demolish it. We have some organizations like, such as Saja, which have tried to protect journalists in South Asia. The other problem we face is the control over media content by those who own it in the absence of a good regulatory framework. Even the advanced countries, they suffer from this problem. But that does not mean we should not work for change. I could go on to many other topics, such as atomic energy, outer space, trade and investment, which Ambassador Haran has dwelt on, meteorology, food security. All these areas, there's a rich scope for problems. Look at food security. If we have a common buffer stocking arrangement, we don't individually have to keep huge amount of food grains to meet shortages. If we have a shortage in one country, we can meet it from another. That's what FAO does. We can do it in our region. Uh, let me reiterate then that regional cooperation in our region is definitely worth pursuing despite difficulties. Let's look at the EU with 28 countries. Each issue is discussed in great detail and progress can sometimes seem painfully slow and bureaucratic. But this is how negotiators of different countries get to know and understand each other and build bridges between their countries. In the end, that counts for a great deal. And the emergence 
of a shared sense of European identity, and everyone gains. Now, as we move from two states to three, four in a system, the number of possible interaction grows rapidly from one to seven to 14. You can count this as an exercise, adding up the possible one to one, one to two, two to two, one to three, etc. interactions. The number goes up rapidly with the number of players. This illustrates the complexity involved in the process. Most of the time, this complexity is managed through meetings of all parties, and one can see the dynamics at work in these meetings. It is not necessarily true that a few players or one player can dominate the process and make it easy. The others tend to gang up to prevent this. To work, all the players must perceive significant benefits in moving on from the status quo. In the case of neighbors, there will also be the complications due to domestic political players and stakeholders on the boundaries between states. Also, there may be differences between perception and reality and between negotiators and stakeholders. Now, in any regional cooperation framework, there are some countries who want to move faster, while others want to move more slowly. Some may not want to move at all or even block or sabotage the process. These are the spoilers. So how do we deal with this? Germany and France, together with Spain and Italy, in the EU have come up with a sensible idea. It has been called multi-speed Europe, or variable geometry Europe, to use an analogy with the variable geometry aircraft that can fly at different speeds. Those countries which want to work together and reach an agreement can do so while others can stay out if they choose. But everyone cannot be held prisoner of one dissenter. We already have several frameworks that cover less than the full EU, the Eurozone, the Schengen area, etc. These are well-known examples. Of course, it is best to get to an agreement with the largest number of countries. But sometimes the path to this goal is slower. Our region can learn a lot from the European experience as well as the experience of ASEAN. I hope you will be stimulated during this conference to let your imagination run free to envisage many other promising avenues for building regional cooperation. The energy and commitment of our youth is a powerful force. Once again, my sincere thanks to Diplomania, the organizing committee, and uh, all of you friends for listening patiently, and my best wishes for the success of this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Bhaskar Balakrishnan. Now I would request Mr. Abdul Haq Azad, third secretary from Af Afghanistan Embassy, to come and speak. Excellencies on the dice. Uh, Leadership of the OP General University, faculty members, students, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to speak here today. At the outset, let me thank the Diplomania for organizing this event. I believe it's very important to engage youth in debating international issues because you will see them in high and leadership position in the future. As such, they play a significant role in shaping the world's future. Dear friends, needless to say that terrorism, climate change, poverty, refugee crisis are some of tough problems our today's world is facing with. On top of that, protectionist trade policies, disregard for international laws, are newly emerging, emerging challenges which are detriment to the world's prosperity and peace. Here in our part of the world, what is inflicting the most suffering on our people and hampering progress is terrorism and extremism. However, Afghanistan bears the brand of terrorism. Today, my country is fighting with terrorist groups on behalf of not only the region, but the whole world. Before 2011, when international security assistance forces known as uh, ISAF troops 
gradually started to withdraw. More than 130,000 coalition forces from 51 countries fought against terrorism in Afghanistan. From 2014, when the ISAF withdrawal completed, the Afghan National Security Forces had to shoulder the, the full responsibilities, responsibilities of combating terrorism. There are 20 terrorist groups in Afghanistan, and, but they have all their uh, support bases and sanctuaries outside of Afghanistan, and close to 20% of these fighters are foreigners. Despite large number of casualties, the Afghan security forces have firmly stood their grounds and have fought with valor and high morale. As such, they proved wrong all those who were predicting a doomsday for Afghanistan upon withdrawal of ISAF, ISAF troops. Considering the location of Afghanistan at the heart of Asia, the security in Afghanistan is vital to the stability and security in Asia. Thus, it's critical that besides the USA international community, the regional countries also provide necessary assistance, including military to Afghanistan, for the sake of stability in the region. In this context, let me express my gratitude to the Indian government and its people for not only financing in executing developmental and capacity building projects in Afghanistan, but also providing military assistance either in the form of training our young cadets or providing helicopters to support our Air Force. Dear friends, terrorism and war is one side of the story you see in the headlines about Afghanistan. The other side of Afghanistan which you rarely see in the news is the stride Afghanistan made in various areas such as education, media, telecommunication, sport, advancement of women's status, and so on. Afghanistan looks very much different today than it was 17 years ago. The recent high turnout of people to vote in the last week parliamentary election, despite the existence of all sorts of security threats and warning from the Taliban, shows the quest of our people for democracy and peace. Since 2001, when the Taliban regime was toppled from power with the US intervention, the government of Afghanistan, besides using its best efforts to rebuild the state institution, it has also made commendable efforts to revive the position of Afghanistan as a transit hub and economic roundabout. Afghanistan, thanks to it is geographical location has been a flash point between the superpowers or a buffer state between empires during the certain periods in its contemporary history. But it served as a transit route and cross road for the uh, interaction of different cultures and civilization. Silk Road passing through ancient Afghanistan can be mentioned as a good example. Initiation of regional projects such as Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline known as TAPI, Kosa 1000, Chabahar Port, Lapis Lazuli Road are clear reflections of Afghanistan effort to turn Afghanistan into a transit hub and a an venue for cooperation. As you may know, South Asia is the least connected region in the world. Though connectivity is in, in instrumental in tapping the trade potential in the region, surely the aforementioned project will enhance trade and regional connectivity, which without any doubt will promote economic growth and prosperity in the entire region and beyond. But the realization of such project mainly hinges on security situation in Afghanistan. Apart from military efforts to dismantle terrorist networks and ultimately clear Afghanistan of terrorism, the government of Afghanistan has been seeking a political solution and making peace with the Taliban. Afghanistan has tried various mechanisms to reach peace with the Taliban, but unfortunately it has not yielded a desired result so far. We believe 
We believe that unless a regional consensus is made and regional cooperation is established, the peace will remain elusive in Afghanistan. I'm very pleased to say that very recently, India and China has started a joint capacity building program for Afghan diplomats in India and China. I hope that this ushers in an era of cooperation in Afghanistan and very much hope that other countries also come on board in establishing cooperation in Afghanistan and create a common understanding on the importance of peace and stability in Afghanistan. I would like to conclude my remarks with a poem from the great Persian uh, poet uh, Saadi, which I believe is very relevant to today's uh, program. Human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Abdul Haq Azad. Uh, that clearly shows that the new generation of diplomats in Afghanistan do see positive uh, developments in Afghanistan with regard to technology and also regional cooperation. Uh, as the mandate is there that we will take few questions from the floor, uh, I would ask the students to kindly raise questions to the panel which is here and uh, have made uh, very uh, pertinent points. Raise your hands, please, whosoever wants. Yeah, okay. Uh, the delegation from Nepal. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm Sridhar Sridhar from a uh, long student from Nepal. Uh, what I can say that we have come up with discussion uh, that is the China issue, and Pakistan has come up with this dimension of China in South Asia. Uh, in my comment is the respective relation that South Asian countries are having with each other uh, is one of the prime concern of South Asia now. Uh, and in this situation, it is obvious that China will have its influence in those countries uh, because uh, uh, it is evident that it has come up with uh, support when uh, those countries are in a name. Uh, so in these circumstances, how India and other South Asian countries should aim to uh, improve the relation with each other and also increase cooperation with China instead of competition with China. Thank you. Can we have a second question? It is very similar to this question. Should India and China uh, pursue India and China pursue strategy instead of competing with one another? They should cooperate and uh, uh, go ahead in this direction. Is the question specifically directed to some uh, panel? Ambassador VP. Okay, VP. Can we have the last question from the floor? Uh, honorable guest, is transnational, regional, and sub-regional mechanisms like uh, BBI and Women's State for the uh, connectivity same uh, development? What essentiality now SARC has for India from the Indian perspective? Thank you. Thank you. Because of competing interests, competing strategic uh, interests, and uh, <clears throat> also, of course, I mean we need to recognize that China has deep pockets. We cannot, we cannot uh, match them. Uh, so we have our own constraints, but uh, as far as cooperating with China in India is concerned, I think I, in South Asia is concerned, I think it's going to be difficult. But there is a ray of hope in the sense that they are cooperating or they have decided to cooperate in uh, in uh, Afghanistan uh, because there is no direct conflict of interest as far as Afghanistan is concerned. And one of the examples is what uh, the distinguished representative from Afghan Embassy said: that is training of diplomats, Afghan diplomats in both India and China. I mean, that's already happening. Second is about your question about you know, what relevance uh, BBI and all have. You know, uh, let's accept that nothing is moving forward in SARC. Uh, okay, I mean, it's a fact. I mean, we have to contend with it. Uh, we have this uh, uh, alternate forum called BBI. Unfortunately, even that has not progressed much. But, uh, you know, generally the uh, tendency is to blame India Park relations uh, for lack of progress in SARC. If that is so, can you explain to me why BBI has not progressed? 
you cannot blame Bhutan for not ratifying ME. Okay, there, and they openly said, yes, we are not joining it now, we will join later, but you, the remaining three can go ahead. After that, what happened? We had a trial run from Dhaka to uh, Delhi, you know, that uh, movement of goods without uh, any check at the border, etc. That went out very smoothly. The, the several media reports about two years back uh, uh, about that, but nothing has happened uh, beyond that. Yes, BBN is a big advantage because its focus is limited. I mean, uh, right now they are dealing with trade, uh, trade, uh, I mean, uh, trade facilitation measures, then water and hydropower. All these areas, I mean, these are carefully chosen ideas where all the countries of the sub-region can benefit. Okay, and there is a possibility of cooperation in the hydropower sector. Now, India had come up with uh, this cross, uh, rules regarding cross-border trade in electricity. This was published uh, for comments. This paper was published for comments by the Ministry of Power in December 2016. Some comments are coming from uh, neighbors. So it's aimed at promoting trade between the, uh, among the BBI and countries. So we are looking at it and possibly we will come up with a revised set of guidelines which should facilitate cross-border trade. Because no country has a veto power here, there is a better chance of something moving forward uh, in the BBI environment. And uh, I hope all of us make best use of it because if that proves a success, there is every possibility that, uh, you know, maybe that lack is a uh, beacon of life or suck to move forward. Thank you. Yeah, <coughs> Do we have some reflections from the Afghan diplomat on the SAR and government in South Asia? China and India plus one. Plus one. How much is more? Yeah, uh, uh, on cooperation in uh, Afghanistan, very recently there was a conversation in India, international center. There were scholars from the uh, US, China, and India. They were uh, uh, speaking about the possibilities of cooperation in Afghanistan. <laughs> And uh, I was very happy to see very, uh, you know, good uh, view from uh, all three countries to on the importance of uh, uh, on the necessity of cooperation in Afghanistan. And uh, yeah, they, they were they told that there is the possibility that we extend this cooperation from in uh, capacity building areas to other areas uh, like. Uh, uh, in uh, other areas, technical areas, to cooperate in Afghanistan, and uh, yeah, so. In WTO, we did a study, and it was a it was an indictment of the South Asian region. The least integrated region economically now is South Asia, even in comparison to Sub-Saharan Africa not to be condescending. So that should actually be a point of departure. The only criticism I would make against my own country, and I now feel happy doing it because I'm not part of the government, and I'm an academic so I can afford to make this, I think we could have been a little bit more generous, economically speaking, to our neighbors. And that is a criticism I will accept. But everything else, I think our neighbors also need to look deep inside. You know, you can't blame India or Indo-Pak relations for everything. This is a mass of humanity in South Asia, and we are lagging behind on every conceivable human development index. It's a matter of collective shame, frankly. I mean, the recent UN report says there are only two regions where now extreme poverty exists. One is Sub-Saharan Africa, the other is South Asia. So I don't think uh, the record has been very proud. So I always ask my students this question, and I think some students are present so they will find it familiar. Why is it that in our South Asian DNA, we are incapable of putting politics aside and cooperating in trade? Look at China, Taiwan. I, I, I always say in my class that the Indo-Pak relationship is considerably better than the one between China and Taiwan. At least India is not pretending that Pakistan is, our, is, is belongs to India. We don't say that. We only say Kashmir belongs to us. We don't say Pakistan belongs to us. China says Taiwan belongs to them. And look at the economic relationship between China and Taiwan. So I think I'm looking to your generation. Maybe you will take this forward because you have no baggage. But otherwise, my starting point, which should come as no surprise, 
also prejudiced because of my background. I think economics and trade has to be the starting point. That has got to be the starting point. And people should rise up against politicians and say, shut up, we want to economically cooperate. That's the only way. The youth have to get up. And you have to develop a constituency of your own where you can stand up to elected representatives and say, sorry, we want this cooperation with India. Why do you block it for political reasons? That, to me, is the only way out. But thank you so much, Shiram, for this opportunity.